So I think we'll start. It's very nice to see you all here uh, to the, for the second one of our conversations, um, a new initiative that we started this semester. And uh, the idea is that we open up this beautiful house to the public, to the different publics of Providence and have people come here for intimate conversations with local artists and thinkers and writers and architects once a week. And then after a little short, after a short presentation, a little Q&A, we hope to have wine and food together with you. And, and uh, it, we had a very nice evening last week. Some of you were there and remembered. So uh, this hopefully will become a uh, ongoing tradition we're already working on next semester. So welcome. I'm Dietrich Neumann. I'm the director of the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage. And it's really a great pleasure to welcome tonight's guests and uh, speakers. Um, I should say the Avenue concept, as you might uh, have seen from our invitation, is really uh, an organization that has changed the city in so many different ways, and I think really exemplary in the way public art is being created and placed into our city and has made Providence so much richer. And I'm delighted that apart from our two speakers, whom you see here, Fran Lawson, uh, Lawson and Nick Platzer, uh, from the Avenue concept. We're also, we have the uh, uh, founder and executive director here, Daryl Thorne, who sits over there. And I'm glad, and we of course can all ask questions afterwards of how this all came about and how it actually functions to all of them. And Jen Harris is also here, the uh, deputy director over there. And we all only know each other uh, unmasked from Zoom so far pretty much. So it's it's really great to see you in, in 3D. And um, so the two presenters today are Fran Lawson, I'll start with her. She, is, um, she has 25 years of experience in the social nonprofit sector and uh, at the Avenue Concept uh, has been engaged in engagement advancement uh, strategies and she started in development and then became executive director of a startup organization at uh, age of 25 and uh, was trained in art history, which is of course fantastic, which is uh, many of us got uh, here as well. And uh, then, um, also at the University of Michigan, got a, a Master of Business Administration and a Master of Public Administration, and it, it focused on strategy, innovation, and marketing. And she has worked in philanthropy, uh, worked as knowledge officer for the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, leadership development, program strategy, and advancement and experience design. And I should point out that this uh, German-sounding last name, Lawson, uh, might remind some of you of a really good wine uh, uh, producer in Germany, and there is a family relationship. So I hope the wine is, that we serve tonight is to your liking. Yeah. And then the other presenter is Nick here. And I've, as I said, when he came in, he beautifully looks like he came straight from making a mural, which is indeed the case. They're working on something downtown. We'll hear about it in a second. And he got his career start uh, in ninth grade as a graffiti artist. I suspect not official commissions, but more in the <laughs> under the protection yeah, of the career style. <laughs> <laughs> career, direction. career direction. And then he spent a lot of time in Vienna. Uh, you said you're almost at the half point where half of your you know, the the amount of time you spend in Vienna is close to the time you spent uh, out of uh, outside of Vienna. And so he speaks uh, Austrian German, which we pointed out as much more beautiful than the actual German German. And uh, uh, he um, founded a gallery there, award-winning gallery that already had to do with commissioning mural artists it's called Inoperable. And it was founded there in 2006 and won several awards and has curated art projects uh, worldwide. And in particular with a number of artists that we'll hear about tonight because you brought them here to Providence as well. I'm thinking of Nichos and Aris and Andrew Hem, I recognize those other mural artists, ROA, Faith 47, Miss Van, Itam Crew, another one you brought here, uh, GAZ, Evoca One, Pixel Pancho, Axel Void, Jess, X Snow, etc. Wonderful names, uh, often artist names, of course. So he uh, is in charge of um, uh, the mural program at uh, the Avenue Concept, and he's always looking for. Uh, local uh, and regional talent, and uh, he started working for the Avenue Concept in 2015. So please help me welcome uh, Nick Platzer and Fran Lawson. I'm actually going to jump up first since we're doing this kind of dual presentation. I'll take us off. Oh, I have to go to your PowerPoint. 
Just a second. So I have, a, I have a quick poll of the room. How many of you all are um, have ever heard of the Avenue concept? We'll start with that. Okay, good. Now, how many of you are relatively new to town? And how many of you been here for more than three years? Okay, it's always a good it's always a good poll because it's kind of an interesting cross uh, tab of people who understand our name or who have heard of our name how long you've been here and if you know what we do. How many of you all have seen the um, image that's in the, the mural that's in the image? How many of you all knew that the Avenue concept was the producer of that image? Okay, it's good. That's good. It's always good to know. It's always good to know. So um, I'm Fran Lawson. I uh, work for the Avenue concept. I'm the strategy person who does engagement and advancement in partnership with the program team. And what that means is I get to talk about art all the time, which is like the greatest thing in the world. I have the best job at the Avenue concept. Nick will say the same and Dara will say the same and Jen will say the same, but I have the best job. Um, so the Avenue concept is an organization that is gonna be celebrating its 10th year anniversary next year on um, in the 22nd year of this century. But actually I've been doing work in this community for a really long time. Yarrow started um, the organization with Darrow's Cans quite a bit before that and was doing these really kind of innovative entrepreneurial pop-up work um, that evolved into one of the most solid public art programs that we have in the state, certainly, and I think regionally and perhaps nationally. Um, the, um, we, we, our little tagline that we're using right now is we make public art happen because our role in public art at this point is really to think about how public art is made and how it's curated and what it means in community. So it's not just like this kind of visionary way of thinking about like, oh, what would a public art program look like? But actually, what can it do? How, how high quality is it? How does it happen? And actually, how does it go from concept to completion? Just to give you a little bit of data, we um, have completed 180 public art projects. There are about 170 artists that we've engaged over that period of time. Sometimes we engage artists on multiple engagements. Um, we find people that we love to work with and that we watch their careers evolve over time if they're an emerging artist. We, we really do a lot of lovely curation in that way. Um, like I said, we take projects from concept to completion. So I think sometimes there's this public perception of like, there's a wall, work just goes up and it magically appears. And actually what happens behind the scenes is really complex and really wonderful and really deep and intense. We take things from here's a wall or a sculpture pad that we would like to see activated. We go through a process of working with stakeholders to see if that can happen. We raise the funds to make that a reality. And then there's this beautiful process of finding the right artist for this, that sweet spot of the right artist for the space, which Nick will really talk about in our mural program. Um, and then taking that through an installation process and then actually amplifying that to community. So concept to completion. We've invested about $1.7 million. I think there's probably a little bit more than that in artwork and infrastructure and everything in this, in this city and a little bit outside of um, the Providence area as well. First large scale murals happened in 2015. And I, I really think a hallmark of our program is the curatorial work that we do and the installation work that we do. Because in some environments, people, artists get hired to do the work. Uh, an artist was saying this this summer and they were like, well, the Home Depot is over there. That's where you should go get your paint. You have a car? You know? <laughs> and, and that's not what happens with us at all, which Nick will talk about a little bit more. Um, I'm gonna roll through some kind of, you know, pieces of sculpture in our 3D program because Brian's not here to talk tonight. Um, we do two main programs and then we have a lot of work that surrounds that. We have a really beautiful and robust sculpture program and a mural program. Um, this people, do, do people remember this piece? Gorgeous, right? Um, Jeho Lee, this work Lotus, international gorgeous work um, brought to Providence, a really, really special and exquisite piece. But this is um, near the, the Rhode Island Foundation in kind of an anchoring space and community. And the beauty of, of all of our work is we think about it as wayfinding, as well as um, just beautifying the city, creating opportunities for economic development, creating opportunities for enjoyment. Um, have many people seen the Pronk bus? 
has anybody seen this? I mean, we see it. My kids and I see it and we're like, ah, oh, the bus, the bus. And there's a punk bus and there's a move bus. So there are two um, graphically wrapped buses that you can see around town. I think one is definitely still in um, rotation. I don't know about the other one. Sometimes our sculpture program is really, really human scale and it's active and you can, this was a very special um, uh, installation that Yaro could even talk about later where, you know, you're actually engaged in the work and you're moving around it in a fundamentally different way. This was in Kennedy Plaza. You can see our crews out um, working to install that work. And then I, I added this slide, uh, Lionel Smith's uh, colossal fragment, because it also really shows, this is Trinity Brew House in the, in the background, that these pieces in best way that public art can bring people into cities and into the downtown corridor and into the, the West End and South Side. And they bring people in so that they can actually experience neighborhoods in a fundamentally different way. And as our program is going to develop in that nature of neighborhoods, I think you're going to see a lot more really gorgeous um, work that is local and resonant and storytelling in that way coming through. I'm gonna let Nick come up and talk a little bit about the mural program, but also just about how this creates space and place. Hey, I'm Nick Platzer. Um, I think you've heard enough about who I am and what I do. Um, and as he said, I'm covered in paint because we're doing a giant mural in downtown. So I apologize, I'm not sort of dressed as formally as you all are, but uh, so yeah, so the mural program kind of, the, the murals really transform space, as you can all imagine. And this is like a one of the prime examples on like a human scale of being able to take uh, a corner of a building. This is actually my old high school. Um, I was probably responsible for some of the vandalism back in the day, but now it's just all grayed out. Generally speaking, it's an ugly school to begin with, but um, we were able to take that corner, that gray corner and create an artwork with Dan O'Neill to really transform that entire courtyard. We had the corner painted there and in the distance you can kind of see the whale painted by uh, DAC-1 from Hawaii and there's P-Funk there and then further down there was a smokestack that was, I remember thinking about wanting to paint that one as a high school kid. Um, and just being able to go into that space and put paint on the wall and it's such a simple act, but it can transform a space in, like entirely. Um, so we, we started out doing a lot of that and I've been doing that since professionally, I guess you could say since 2005. Um, this is another example of bringing what used to be a sort of a derelict parking lot space. You would never think twice about that ugly wall. It's been, you know, painted by the city's anti-graffiti crew, but bringing it in and investing in the, the substrate of like putting in a, a total skim coat over the wall to make it really smooth that the, the paint and everything would last and creating this iconic work there has really transformed that space. Um, after we did that, I think, I think it was already in the process, but after we did that, they then went back and restored the, the mural behind it, I think, because they were, it was getting outshined and everyone was starting to look at ours instead. So it was a little bit of like a, you know, a little kick in the ass for them. So it's fun. Um, and the connections that these, these murals make with people, I'll go back to this one quickly because this was one of the first murals we did where for me personally, I realized how important representation is in these things. It's not just about taking a space and transforming it into whatever you want it to be or whatever the artist wants, is that what you're putting on these spaces means a lot to a lot of people because the artists oftentimes will just come to town they have two weeks to paint their mural, they're in, they're out, bingo bongo, it's over. But they started realizing that like, this is a gift to the community and like the people that live there, they have to then exist, coexist with this mural going forth. They really have to start thinking about what they're putting into these spaces. And this was done by Andrew Hem, who's a Cambodian artist. His family had to flee from Cambodia um, because of the Khmer Rouge genocides. And he grew up in LA and he went back to Cambodia when he was adult for the first time, went hiking in the mountains and this little girl was following him on the trail, sat down next to him at one point. He took out his camera, snapped a photo and just immediately knew that someday, somewhere, he was going to paint that photo. Didn't know when, he had a completely different design when he showed up to Providence. We've done all the permitting with a whole different design, but on the spot, he decided, this is it. This is the moment I need to paint her. And 
we sort of scrambled. Yara was sort of like, for like, wait, 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 what, what, what's happening? But we switched it around, had this beautiful moment, and he created that work. And after that fact, we had the Cambodian communities in Laotian and just Asian families in general coming out and saying, you don't know what it means to have representation on a wall. That, you know, you go through the city, you see advertisements, TV everywhere. So it's, it's generally white people. And that to see an Asian face on a wall at this scale means so much to us. And that really sort of started clicking in my brain being like, oh shit, I need to start really thinking about that. I was always trying to think a little bit about representation and just trying to always diversify the artists that I worked with and showed. Um, but with these murals, it was really important for me to be like, okay, I need to really bring in these voices to Providence. One of the primo examples of that was having uh, the artist Gaia. He, when we start, first started talking about this wall, I knew he was going to hit a home run. I've worked with him a few times in the past, and he's always really considerate about, about his content. Um, he asked me when, when we were doing all the sort of prep work for this wall, is like, can you do all the research you can as to find out what building used to exist on that lot? You know, what, what is the history of this space? What can you, what can you find out? Um, went to the historical societies, preservation, everyone. It was really hard to actually find something about that specific location. But what we did find was all the white male history. It was, it only went back a certain amount of time and it was primarily Europeans who moved to Providence who started up a wholesale grocery or a printing press or whatever it was. And that, all that basically sparked him to say, well, what about the history before that? Because you don't talk about, we, ne we generally don't talk about who was there before any of these Europeans showed up and, and, who, and whose histories get told. So when you think, what is the history? You immediately think, okay, what buildings were there? What was this and that? But the indigenous people were, have been there for way, way longer. So we connected with the Tamaquag Museum uh, and had went through a sort of permission seeking process with them to use imagery from uh, their tribe. Uh, it was very important for them to have a contemporary dressed young indigenous woman holding a portrait of Princess Redwing as a connection to her heritage and past. Um, and being there, we didn't even realize that there's such a bigger connection to that space that Waybosset Street, which is right behind the mural, is most of the streets in downtown run on a straight and parallel grid system. Waybosset's one of the few that kind of like zigzags through the city, and that's because it follows the original walking trails that indigenous people would take through the city. Um, and it would lead you to the mouth of the river, which is where it was a big trading post for all the different tribes would come and meet there and then later became a trading point for um, all the ships and the industrial revolutions that would come in through the bay and come up to the mouth of the river. Um, so it's kind of interesting that that history just naturally follows that space. As we were creating this, people were coming at me and like, you don't realize that this is like the perfect placement for this mural to celebrate indigenous people and especially indigenous women um, who are sort of the backbones of those communities. So again, it was sort of this idea of like, even though art, the artist Gaia himself is a, is a white European male, his, his heritage, it was sort of him using his skill and his talent to be able to lend a voice to this community, working with them, asking them what story they want to have told, and him kind of just being a vessel for it. You know, he's like, I can't say your story for you, but I know how to paint a ginormous mural and I can help put it on the wall for you because painting an 80 by 100 foot wall in a span of two weeks is a ridiculous task that very few people can do. So, um, you know, it, it's sort of him lending his, his talent to that. Um, again, and then speaking to, this is currently up, this just got installed this summer. This was uh, created by a local artist, Kendall Joseph, uh, incredibly talented, up and coming in the scene. And he was invited to do our Way Bossett Street residency. So this, I don't know if any of you know this, this is that wall that's just like, doesn't have a back to the building. It looks like a spaghetti Western facade. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it, the, the panels have been sealed, the doors and the windows of the old bank were sealed up and the, and the building owners reached out to us and said, you know, why don't we use this as a platform, as a canvas for artists? So every year we invite locals artists to come out and repaint that, uh, these panels. Kendall, after everything that we went through last year, felt very um, 
sort of obligated to pay homage to the artists and the creatives in the community and in Providence that he looks up to and that inspire him. So all five of these people are artists uh, from Providence. Uh, some of you may recognize Bert Krenka, the founder of ASU 20 and the metal is big mug with the with the beard. He spent about a day doing that beard. He was like dead after that. He took it some time off because he was like, oh, I can't do it anymore. Um, but again, it's sort of this idea of like representation, the showing, the telling those stories in the communities that you're in. Um, going back to 2015, this is our one of our, our biggest install at the time, um, a mural created by Best. Uh, he's a Polish artist and right across from him was a mural painted by his fiance at the time. Uh, at this point, it was really just about sort of bringing art and bringing world-class artists to the city of Providence. Everyone knows, obviously, we've got RISD in our backyard and Brown and all these great schools, but the mural scene was really lacking. I mean, we had Shepard Ferry, but you know, we, can have, we can have conversations afterwards about him. But um, there wasn't a lot going on, and I really wanted to bring, these are all artists that I had known and worked with and befriended for the last 10 years working in Austria. And I really wanted to be able to bring them to Providence. For me, it was a really personal item that I just really like, they didn't know where Rhode Island was. They didn't know anything about Providence. And for them to be able to bring them here and showcase their work here, every single artist so far has fallen in love with Providence, even the one that's currently here. She's like, this city is amazing. She really wants to come. She wants to extend her stay, which I'm sort of, we'll see about that. Um, but it's just sort of building that connection. And for this is sort of a personal one. Um, and this was sort of the real springboard. This really put us on the map. And still to this day, it stops people in their tracks. I've been in that parking lot for the last two weeks. And every single day, there's at least 20 to 30, possibly 50 people stopping, taking photos in that lot. And they're just walking by. They're, just, they're not there to see murals. They're walking down Washington Street and they peek over and they see that mural and they come in. And then it's been great the last two weeks because there's an active mural happening at the same time. So. I don't know. He's pretty good looking. <laughs> I was I was very lucky that the artist had used himself as the to to as the reference, but then sort of as he was getting to the face, felt like you know it seems a little egotistical of me to put my own face on a building in your city. And I was just joking. I said, well, why don't you put my face? He's like, all right, let's do it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so you can. <laughs> I did give him a little shake because I was like, you could have given me a little more hair. My, my hairline's getting a little thin up there. Oh my God. Oh, oh well. Um, this is the actual mural that was across from it. And um, you can see from what's happened in 2015 when she first painted it, very vibrant. He's a lot of neons, bold. And over the years, it's just really faded. Um, the, it was a it was, a, it was a big experiment for the city to give us the, the trust to do these murals. Um, and this it was one of the examples where they were just sort of like, okay, you cannot do any prep to that wall. You can't do anything. You can only paint within a certain uh, defined parameters of the, of, the, of the wall space. And it was great. It got our foot in the door, got a conversation started with them, but we were able to go back to them and say, look, you know, it's failing. It's, it's come that time. Uh, it's now six years later. And we really wanted to step it up and, and get the entire wall. This mural took about, I'd say, a third of the wall space. Um, and we just showed, went through, I think it was probably two, three years process of just having conversations with the city, with the DDRC, uh, preservation societies, architects, all these people to say the brick, there's a, there's a law in Rhode Island that you cannot paint unpainted historic exposed brick. Um, I get it. But there's some brick that's not that pretty or that needs to be saved. And this wall is a prime example of like the whole left section was patched work of cinder blocks and cement bricks and painted sections and there's I-beams and pipes. And it just was like, this doesn't reflect the beautiful side of Providence. All the other beautiful historic buildings, I get it, but this is a rundown derelict wall that needs to be salvaged. And so, Going through that process, we were able to get permission this year to redo the entire thing. Um, and this is the same wall. Basically, that mural occupies essentially from where the scissor lift is that way. Um, but we were able to extend the entire thing. And the artist just signed it like 
two hours ago. So I guess it's kind of wrapped up. So uh, this is still in the making of process for that for that piece. Um, it's it's a absolutely beautiful work. Um, it's completely transformed that parking lot. We've had people stopping in every single day, every single night, just flabbergasted, standing in front of it, the color, the story, everything about it has just like been blowing people away. And it, we were joking last night because people always come up and they'll be like, oh, that's the best one. It's better than the other ones. Or like, that one's horrible. I like this one. And it's like, it's not a competition with these murals. It's not, we're not creating them to be one better than the other one. We're just trying to create a beautiful portfolio of work in the city so that I see it more as a competition with other cities. I want to have Providence have the best portfolio. I want people to say, oh, Providence is better than Boston. I mean, we all want them to say that because, but especially in this case where we have a, like a say in it, where we can actually contribute to that, that, that conversation. So for me, if people can say that this city overall has better murals than any other one else, New York or Boston or Toronto or whatever, that's what's important. And I think this one's really been hitting the home run once again. Um, so yeah. Sorry? Um, it's right downtown. The building number is 100 Washington Street. Um, it's where Blake's is, uh, the Matthewson Street Church, um, that whole parking lot. Frisky fries. Frisky fries, yeah. There's a Boost Mobile, there's a Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it's hard to miss, especially at night when it's like lit up. Um, we were playing around with the lights last night and there's we there's ways to shoot it on this one. There's a lot of neon, so they really pop at night when it gets hit with the lights. Um, so it's really fantastic. And it's a huge contribution to the city now. And I think um, it's gonna be, I think one of the hotspot hangouts. We've already had people, there's a photo shoot planned for tonight with a reggae artist. Uh, we watched a bunch of people taking their Instagram selfies there yesterday, so it's already kind of catching on and, and getting crazy. So, and then Fran can jump back in about this, we'll, and we'll, then we'll have. We're doing this quickly because we really wanted a lot of time for Q and A because we think that your questions are a lot more interesting than the data that we're probably providing. Um, one thing I also want to say, I want to give props to Nick and the team for this. All of the walls are, most of them are push walls for the artists. This is the biggest wall that Georgie Garden of Journeys ever done. Andrew Hemmett was the biggest wall he had done at the time. Like, best like the, matches. right? Every, pretty much best mm -hmm. it was the biggest wall he'd ever done. The top, I mean, so it's, this is, a, this city is a space for experimentation, right? Like we own that as a community, but, but I really think that this program embodies that in a really gorgeous way. And then the artists go on and do another big wall somewhere else. But at the time it's it's a hard lift for the team it really is but it's awesome so um just quickly so covid gave us the gift the silver lining gift of um understanding our value as self-guided opportunities for people we pivoted really quickly in covid we were like people can be outside let's get them outside and looking at art and we had a really robust website but we didn't have a way for people to understand how to get around easily and quickly so we white labeled an app and we're able to put all of the content that we have spent tons of money and time and thought doing the storytelling in one place. Got it off just the website and into the hands of people. So you can download our public art app. It's in the trifold that you have. You can just QR code it and download it. Um, and the really lovely part is you get to watch these gorgeous videos a lot. Not every um, installation has a video, but a lot of them do, where you hear the artist's own words about their work. And that is such a beautiful thing to experience. And just these, they're just these really gorgeous humans that are talking about what they do and what they love and why. Um, there are pictures, you can kind of get more information on the, and there's some self-guided questions. They're kind of meant for real learners, early learners of art. So if you're a more kind of robust art aficionado, they may seem a little simple, but it's great to work with people who are not necessarily as comfortable in the art environment. Um, and just so you know, um, our newsletter comes out every other month and always has really great information about stuff that's coming up. You can see our works on view, you can download the app, and you can also donate. We are an organization that um, runs off of donations. We get some, we do a lot of work with corporations that are interested in having art in their space, which is wonderful, but we also really deeply rely on the gifts of people in community. Um, you can make public art happen, we like to say. 
Um, and that's pretty remarkable. Like the, the wall that we just did was funded by, in large part by a really generous donor. And that means the world to us. So just so you know. And with that, we'll answer questions. Well, we also have Yaro here too. So I want to, I'm going to also say that Yaro should jump in on these questions because I think he hold, he and Jen can kind of speak to that history and vision a little bit too. So you, you can answer that or. Um, I think Yaro will probably go more into depth about like the, the inner workings. For me, what I've always done with the Avenue concept and also with my own gallery is watching the other programs and seeing how they, what the failures they've done and then steering away from that. So for instance, what was really big for a long time was doing these mural festivals where you have a set budget, invite 30 artists from around the world that come in, it's craziness, all the media hype is there, and then everyone leaves and it's just, everyone's burnt out and it doesn't feel great. Um, and I told, when I started working with Yara, I said, I do not want to do a festival. I want, no way are we gonna do that. I've only heard horror stories from all the artists about it. And so, working that that's always sort of function for me it's sort of almost being like a step behind but figuring out the mistakes that other people are making and then navigating your way around it uh, to not hit those and i think i would say we've done a pretty good job so far with like steering away from those and like really hitting it home runs with all the artists every single artist who hasn't worked with with us or with me in the past has got left here being like, wow, that was one of the best, if not the best experience I've had painting a mural because you were here for me the entire time, like getting me everything I needed, picking me up at the hotel, getting me food, getting my materials, getting real lifts that work that don't break on you. Um, it's those little things that like add up and really make the experience what it is. And every single artist has left wanting to come back and you know recommending us to all their other friends. So, so. Is a good way to do it. I want to add something to that that I've noticed in the work that Nick does particularly. So you, you know, you work with artists like Gaia who can do an 8,000 square foot wall, right? Like Gaia's got, he is, he knows what he's doing. He's got his assistants. He's down with all of his work. And then we work with different artists on different levels. So if you have an emerging artist who is like, gets the way boss at facade, maybe the back of the facade for the first time. And they're like, and they're doing this. Nick's like, hey, there's an easier way to do this, or you may want to think about this. And so he has this relationship of artist development that comes alongside the artist. And I think that that's something that is kind of unusual as well, that a lot of times artists are like, there's your wall, you got to go. Um, so it's a developmental opportunity. And I think the work becomes really strong because of that. And then we've seen those artists go on to these you know, new heights. Our, our desire is to see artists not just work in Rhode Island. Like we wanna see them in Florida. We wanna see them in um, California. We wanna see them all over the United States. They have to be ready and they have to feel confident in their work. And I think that's the developmental space that we really afford them. That's a little bit different than, than other cities. You go to other cities and you just don't, you see work that's pretty good at that level, but it's not great. And you see the work that, that work that Kendall did, Kendall, that's great work. And it's taken, I mean, he's, he works really hard. He practices a lot. Like, he's good. Anyway. I have a couple of questions. Um, in Philadelphia, there's several blocks where it's multimedia, um, broken ashtrays that are mosaic and done into um, art. Has that ever come up as an idea where it's not just painting, but added other things onto it. The other question is um, the model history, which is probably the most famous 
Street in America, Bentley Street. There's several places that could be bus. <laughs> like Ben Dins. <laughs> that side of that building could need you. And I was just wondering if there was ever the opportunity to do something appropriate to that area because it is so historic. I'll answer the first question and then Yarrow and, um, and Nick can answer the second one. We did an installation last year on the front of the way boss of facade, which was phenomenal. Amy Bartlett Wright, who is a is a really well known muralist in town. She's she does um, she's a trained biologist, I think is her her she's a scientist. She does uh, kind of nature based mural work, but she'd never really worked in three dimensions before in a mural environment. So she took the front of the facade and she built these like gorgeous birds. I don't know if, did you see them? Mm -hmm. So they, they came off the building and they, I mean, they were just phenomenal. Um, she'd never done that before. And she was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this. I wanna try this, I wanna stretch myself because that's really what that facade is about. So she, so Nick partnered with our sculpture manager, Brian Dowling, who's an awesome guy and really gifted installer and gifted artist himself. And they helped Amy figure out how to make that possible. And that was, they sought permission from the building owner, the whole thing, it was like a really long, process but it was amazing and so that kind of work you'll see that but that wall rotates so so the the permanence of work I think matters like are you going to cement something into something how long is it going to last um that ha hasn't necessarily been part of our program in the past although I think people artists if an artist came up with a great idea it would be a consideration Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't dealt with the those complications in specifically, but uh, I just do know that the Providence is a very historic city, and they're very sort of tight about what you can and cannot paint. Um, I'm the type of person who just likes to avoid those complications. If I see them coming, I'll just sort of be like, well, there's plenty of other neighborhoods and buildings that I can go paint that I won't have to uh, bang my head up against the wall. Uh, whereas Yarrow, I think, enjoys those challenges <laughs> and sort of steers, <laughs> sails his ship directly into it. Um, uh, so yeah, Yarrow, if you want to talk about some of those storms, but. Yeah, so um, you have the concept of prototype at RISD actually actually has an undergrad firewalls. And the idea was to look at the big specs of the thousand dollars a year building for some of Many of those animations are small buildings. A student with or a freshman or something who had a campus they want to paint like pipe, they would put it on the sidewalk and then spray paint and it would leave a little square. The next morning and it the neighborhood association for benefit street would call the school and say, we can't have the trap boat and say the square cut went back. We know Rizzi had no idea who it was, and no one could count who that person was, but it was always in front of the foundation of the lab or whatever. So Rizzi took the job themselves in the facilities to go out and have these people do a painting job on the school sidewalk for the sandblaster, which is a big company. So they spent a lot of money sort of chasing down and covering the square back of 
along with the Star Wars Geyser and all the other geysers in Japan. So I, I sort of went, it kept coming back over and over again. And I was saying, I said, well, instead of, you know, why don't we experiment with these ideas and we turn this into some of our space experiments? So I built a relationship with them with the art model. And I find these spaces where most of our paint streets are understood, and I can also relate to it. So students would be there, the intermix all these things together. Um, I wanted, I'm always interested in bringing that to the energy stream. I think that contrast of contemporary and just one can be really positive, but it also can create sort of a, con a conflict of interest in many ways. So people aren't thinking about how much is sustainable if you start by having find these people are interested in that dialogue because people are interested in it and it's not really worth moving forward but there are ways of doing contemporary you can do the talk you can do the paper mache you can do the yarn there's a lot of things that aren't permanent but it can be a way to break the ice and make people jump on the issue so if that's something that you would want to do and be a champion and help us think about that there's the connection we all would love that to, 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 to continue that conversation and be included I think another thing I want to bring up is that Yara was really spearheaded us doing um, utility boxes in the last year, which are often magnets for graffiti or just tagging, not good, not like really nice graffiti, but like just tagging. Um, and it provides a space for emerging artists, some, some kind of existing kind of more practiced artists to have a different dimensional space in which to work. Um, the ones that we have done, there are lots that are done around town. The ones that we have done, you'll see our little tack tree on and ideally have their there should be a plaque on all of them. We're, I've been in a really busy season, so hopefully they're all plaqued by now. Um, but they all tell stories as well. And um, they kind of, we've created it as a way finding path down Westminster Street. There's a installation at the Biltmore Park now. Um, and that's another kind of way to, ideally, they're not getting tagged all the time, but if they are, it's something we can remediate pretty easily. Any questions? What about the uh, Maya Reiki, what you do, and I'm always wondering, how do you pull that off? And you mentioned a little bit, you had individual donors, and I wonder if you could say a little bit that there's sort of some steady flow of income that you can rely on if you have to raise funds for every single one of these murals. And ultimately, it sounds like a really uh, banal and basic question, but I would love to know just a sort of ballpark figure, how much does it actually cost to put a gigantic mural on it? Do you want to start with that question first? And then, Jen, can you answer the, the flow question? Um, so, yeah, we put together a rough budget uh, estimate, something like the uh, Gaia mural, the one the indigenous woman holding the portrait, uh, costs about $100,000. Uh, can go up from there as well. Uh, but that's, that's to cover all the infrastructure, to cover lifts, repair work, paint, artist stipends. Uh, the time that we have to take to manage it. I mean, that's like years and years of conversation going to the city and talking to building owners, talking to neighbors, talking to community members. Um, it adds up really, really quickly. So it sounds like kind of a crazy number, but um, when, when you start breaking it down to what everything it costs, it, it adds up really quick and it's actually kind of a but, but if you look at the estimate. amplification of that $100,000, that image, that still here image, mm -hmm. is utilized everywhere. In fact, the, um, the woman pictured, Lindsay, who's lovely, was in a car wreck this year. And when the GoFundMe came out, it said, the face of Rhode Island needs your help. And she's the face of Rhode Island, not only because she's an activist and she's an artist and she's a great person, but she literally is the face of Rhode Island because of that mural. Like that's how people know her in a lot of ways, not claiming that, but there's a symbiosis of the city and the state using that mural as a real draw. Um, so it's, its value is 10X that $100,000 investment. So that, I mean, just that's kind of the way that we think about this work is that it draws people in, but also just the way that it, um, it kind of demonstrates value of the city to the broader community. And then Jen, do you want to talk a little bit about? Yeah, so you know, we're, we're, in a, we're in a space where we're maturing as an organization. Um, as a, a life cycle of a nonprofit, you kind of start off in this very entrepreneurial space. And there was a core group of supporters that really believed in public art and really believed in making public art in thousands. And so they really helped build those early years of innovation and entrepreneurial 
experimentation. And over the last few years, the team that has come together has such done such an amazing job with getting awareness out there, helping to really put the infrastructure in place to be a successful nonprofit and really start thinking about what does it mean for fundraising and for you know building strategic partnerships and having lots of different kinds of revenue coming in for the next 10 years. We're we're just building those systems. And we're, you know, in the time that I've been involved. We've had such an outpouring of people really coming together and saying we want to support, but it's a we're still in kind of an experimental phase. You know, we're we're recognized as a mature organization, but it takes a lot of people coming together. It's a process of writing grants and programming and bringing community partners in together and corporations and individual donors and tons of people that can participate in in small towns and things like that. So you know, it's a it's a it's a complicated conversation that we're always having to try to figure out um, how we can do this more and better. And obviously, you know, the things that you're referencing, you know, that that whole wall of that one is um, really it's an interesting space to be in because you have a donor who's supporting a mural that will live for a finite period of time on a wall that does not belong to them. So we're still in fear. I mean, I, if I had to say one thing about everything that I've known about Yaro and all of the team that we've worked with, it's, it's really been about innovation and experimentation. And so many asked the question about providence. I think it's all about providence, like mm -hmm. everything about this organization. And so that was the very important thing to kind of bring that vibe of creativity and experimentation. Um, I think this is a good moment to talk about moving the whole thing into a more personal conversation the next two this bottle of wine and food I should I'm obliged to remind you of Brown's uh, COVID rules we're very cautious around it so the idea is we can take off the mask when you eat and drink you are supposed to have a six foot distance from each other we'll also open the door if you want to step outside but uh, uh, the most important thing I wanted to do is of course thank our presenters and thank you very much Oh, and I want to actually thank Lise who has been at the door and has uh, you know prepared everything as she's been a remarkable teacher, undergraduate student. Last week I wanted to take such a move over there.